In the gospel accounts, there are a number of resurrection stories, and these stories do not always agree with one another. For instance, who was the first person to the tomb? Well, Mark says it was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome who went to the tomb. When they got there, the stone was already rolled back, and inside the tomb was a young man in a white robe. Matthew, however, says that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb, experienced an earthquake, and an angel from the Lord descended from heaven, and he rolled back the stone before their very eyes. In Luke, Mary Magdalene, Johanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women, not named, went to the tomb, saw the stone already rolled away, were joined by two men in dazzling clothes who talked to them and explained the resurrection. In John, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. She seems to be all by herself. She sees the stone has been removed, and she went to bring Peter and John to tell them what had happened. And only after these two disciples left did she meet and talk with Jesus. But all of these stories talk about fear, confusion, and amazement. You know, in the variety of stories that are connected with the resurrection, the variety itself makes me feel like they represent real memories from a stressful event. Because all of us remember things in different ways. I have five sisters, and when we talk about any given Christmas celebration, you'd swear we had been in a different house. Because we all think different things matter to us, different things were said to each of us, we were in different places. This is why we find out that eyewitness testimony is not as accurate as we wish. Court cases sometimes find that they can be problematic. But we bring into our experience whatever happens to us, and when we relate it back, it involves us as well as what really happened. The fact that these people did not sit down some afternoon and coordinate their stories so that they all said exactly the same thing makes me feel how important and personal they were. Those stories were to them. They were not going to conform their story or their memory to anyone. You can almost hear them say, you can take it or you can leave it, but this is how it was for me, and I'm going to tell you my story. According to the writer of the Gospel of John, the story we're going to read this morning happened at least a couple of weeks after the resurrection, and it's a story that reflects how the resurrection affected one of Jesus' followers and how subsequent events shaped his understanding. This is Peter's story. John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. They went out, they got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to him, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. And he said, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he had been naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. 
So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said, come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. The second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Then he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he had said to him, for the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. And he said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, Jesus said to him, follow me. The word of the Lord. What kind of story is this? This isn't a Jesus has risen from the dead story. The writer of John tells us that Jesus had already appeared to his disciples twice, and if twice wasn't going to convince them three times, wasn't probably going to be any better. This is not a believe in the resurrection story. It is a so now what story. It is a commissioning story. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have a commissioning story which happens very early in Jesus' ministry. It's a staple of Sunday school lore. Jesus is walking along the sea. He sees the fishermen. That's the same sea, by the way. The Sea Tiberius is just another name for the Sea of Galilee. He sees the fishermen walk, including Peter. He says, come follow me. And their lives are changed in an afternoon. They are now disciples, which means learners. And who is their rabbi? Over a variety of experiences, they begin to realize that their rabbi is someone who was sent by God himself. And just why he is sent and what is going to happen takes place in a step-by-step -step painful and exciting unveiling. Jesus was sent on God's mission. He dies, and they're full of despair. He was resurrected, and they are filled with awe and questions, lots of questions. And then, and then Peter says, let's go fishing. Fishing? Is let's go fishing a reasonable response to death, fear, and complete confusion? The answer is yes. Sometimes it is. Well, maybe not fishing, at least not for all of us, but returning to what we know, what we feel we can do well, going back to normal is a very common response to death, fear, and confusion. What do I know? What can I do? What is it that makes the world make sense? For Peter, and no doubt for the other disciples as well, fishing was an escape into normalcy. It is possible that for Peter, fishing represented something else. It may well have represented the end of his life as Jesus' disciple. 
Do you remember the old saying, don't quit your day job? It's a rather snide way of remark that is made when somebody tries something new and they're not very good at it, you know, like, would you like to hear me sing an aria from the opera La Traviata? You didn't have to laugh that fast. <laughs> and so I do it. And somebody looks at me and says, don't quit your day job. It's a rather nasty way of saying, I don't think you're making a go with this new endeavor. You're not very talented. You have no gifts. You better stick to what you know. Was Peter really ready to take refuge in the ordinary? Goodness knows he had plenty of the extraordinary over the last three years, and he hadn't always done a good job of rising to the occasion. And as the group of disciples gathered around a charcoal fire where the fish were being grilled, did Peter's memory center on that last charcoal fire he had gathered around in the courtyard of the high priest? Where Peter, instead of following Jesus, had managed to deny him again and again. Did that make it seem likely that perhaps he wasn't cut out to follow his calling? How he had spoken so bravely. He was really quite full of himself. I'll follow you anywhere. And then he failed so totally. And this even after he had been warned that it was going to happen. With a track record like this, it may be a good time to lay down his attempt to be some kind of worker in the vineyard of God. There may be a very good time to call this the end and get on with real life. Or was Peter's response even simpler than that? Perhaps he was looking back and remembering that when Jesus was being tortured, Peter could do nothing. As he watched Jesus die, he could do nothing. He wasn't the one that came up with a burial spot. That was somebody on the council named Joseph. They said he was a disciple, but he was a secret one. He wasn't even part of the inner circle, for pity's sakes. When Jesus' body needed a respectful resting place, again, there was nothing Peter could do. Nothing Peter could offer. And then came the resurrection. God's mighty intervention in the usual events of the human condition. Obviously, Peter wasn't going to help with that. It seemed like when they came to the end of following Jesus around and learning what they could learn, what they had learned in the end was that there was very little they could do. In the end, they're just fallible human beings, confused, without a script, without enough information or strength to do that great act. Perhaps realistically, this was the end of all heavenly possibilities. Perhaps somebody should have told him three years ago that he was not cut out to do the work of God. He was a fisherman. But if this is how Peter was thinking, there is also a suggestion that although this seemed like the end, Peter hungered for more. At the very least, Peter hungered to be reconciled with Jesus. The story gives all kinds of little hints about the state of Peter's heart. He didn't recognize Jesus at first, but as soon as John says, it is the Lord, it's Peter that jumps overboard to swim to shore first. He couldn't wait for the boat to dock, even though they were very close. It had to be now. Once ashore, the first one to speak is Jesus. And although he has fish already cooking, he says, bring some of the catch you have just caught. And again, it's Peter who pushes ahead, hauls the net ashore, apparently all by himself. Peter seems to be trying to do anything he can do to prove to Jesus that he is following him just as hard as he can go. Then Jesus gathers a group together in what almost seems like a communion moment, as close to one as anything that is found in the Gospel of John where Jesus takes the bread and shares it with them, and then the fish. Certainly, at the very least, Jesus has signaled his love and fellowship with the entire group. And then, for Peter, 
the story suddenly turns very personal. Three times Jesus asks Peter to confess his love. Three times Peter does, although by the third time he is disheartened and even hurt. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. To these protestations of love and devotion, Jesus turns the focus away from how Peter feels and out towards others. Using the kind of good shepherd language that Christ had once applied to himself, he charges Peter to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And then just in case he hadn't yet grasped what was being asked of him, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. As it turned out, Peter had been right. That moment on the shore signaled the end of many things. For Peter, it was the end of his life as a disciple, the beginning of his life as an apostle. He no longer would be a person who primarily learned. He was becoming a person who also shared what he had learned, a person who went out to others. The next time we see Peter, he'll be back in Jerusalem and giving guidance to a group of believers. The next time, right after that, he's giving a sermon on the streets of Jerusalem. And that day, 3,000 people were converted to the new church. But it was also the end of Peter's endless battle to prove himself. Throughout the years he walked with Jesus, he demonstrated examples of a man who had tried to have the most emphatic answers. You are the Messiah. Show the greatest devotion. I will never deny you. And display the bravest acts of faith. Walk on water, why not? Splash. Oh, that's why not. After this post-resurrection encounter by the sea, we see a man who's begun to realize that he was called into a life of service not a life of exhibition. And I think this began not as a result of the resurrection as an event, but because Jesus overlooked what Peter could not do and called him to share what he could do. He validated the real man, the one standing before him, still dripping from yet one more crazy wet encounter with the sea. And he touched him with words and actions that said, I love you, and you are mine. Peter is not unique. If Peter was unique, this story would be a curiosity and very little else. But we all are called. In our tradition, this calling often touches our lives before we can even speak, before we can walk, and before sometimes we can even sit up on our own. If we were baptized as babies in the arms of a family member, the pastor opened a book and told us and told everyone about our calling. And he or she said, in baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, unites us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church. We are the body of Christ and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. And then the pastors would tell those who were gathered, who were old enough to understand, remember the joy of your baptism. Whether we are baptized in babyhood or childhood or as adults, that baptism represents the beginning of being claimed and called by God. And since that time, we belong to God. And from then on, we are united with Christ in his resurrection. And from then on, we are commissioned to share in the work and the ministry of our Lord. And often since that time, we will be told to remember that but we often fall short. Failing to give witness in word or deed to our faith. And yet Jesus doesn't just call us, Jesus also forgives us when we fall short of our calling. 
And Jesus doesn't just forgive us, but then he often calls us again. And Jesus doesn't just call us to try again. Jesus also invites us to share what we have and gives us God-breathed work to do. As a congregation, are we ready to hear that? This is Easter season, the season when a great variety of stories surrounding the res re resurrection ring in our ears and resound in our heart. Are we ready to hear that those places we fall short of our calling does not signal that our calling has come to an end? Are we ready to hear that we can and will hear the call of our Lord again and again? Are we ready to hear that our ministry is not an arena in which we will do great things to the amazement of others? Instead, our calling is a neighborhood where we will reach out in simple ways to make God's love real to others. Are we ready to hear that in our journey of faith, we are going to fall short of our goals? We will at times compromise. We will not always follow through. We will time and again disappoint and even fall away. Are we ready to hear that although we thrill to hear the gospel story of where Jesus for the first time calls the disciples and says, come follow me, it is even more important that we hear the story of Peter being called again. Because wherever you are in your journey with God, it is not the end. Because Jesus does not give up on us. He will call us again and again to work that really matters. He will call us to a resurrected life, and that life begins long before our death. Can you hear that? Yes? Well, then for you it is Easter. Hallelujah. <laughs>